Hi, I'm Tanya and I'm going to show you how to do a little bit of medieval laid and couched work. This is the same technique that was used on the Bayer Tapestry. Laid and couch work is really more of the proper name for it and I prefer the name laid and couch work because there are lots of other pieces done in this technique throughout the Middle Ages. And I was going to do a little flower for you today just to demonstrate technique but instead I've chosen this little chap here who I always think of him as a baby chicken dragon because uh, he's like a cross between the two and he's from the literal Psalter because why would you have flowers when you can have a baby chicken dragon so I'm going to start off with I'm using this lovely all my threads in the kits, they're all naturally dyed in the wool kits. The silk ones aren't, but the wool ones are. And this is a madder dyed thread. Madder is a, a root which is native to Turkey, which can be grown in England as well. And it gives a range of colours from bright red to soft pinks and apricots. And I've used this orangey colour because it's very similar to what you see a lot of the time in the literal Psalter, which is what the little dragon is taken from. Now, you can anchor anywhere in the back of there, and it's actually best with this technique to anchor within the design so that you cover up where you've anchored. And the first stage of laden couch work is very, very simple. I'm just laying down the thread. Now I'm using a double for this and you can see I do have a very, very long thread. It's the full length of the thread. And you always take what I would refer to as the line of least resistance. And that's the longest line you can possibly take across your design. So I've done one great big long stitch right the way across the design. And then I'm going to come up right next to that. It's, it's basically one thread past it and go down again. So all I'm doing is I'm filling in this area of design by laying down these long stitches, hence laid and couched work. Now the canvas I'm using is actually an even weave wool canvas and I was always taught that you use a linen canvas and that's what I used for many many years and then I was doing a replica of a medieval piece called the Rekia Hild Antipendium which is from Iceland and which is a, an altar frontal and I did it, and I did it on linen, and it went very well. And then halfway through, I found an extra bit of research on that piece and found out it was done on a wool canvas. So the next time I did a big piece of embroidery, I did it on a wool canvas. And wool on wool is an absolute joy to work with. Because you know how sometimes your thread and your background canvas can sort of argue with each other a little bit. Wool on wool doesn't do that. Wool kind of accepts its own. It's like if you've ever done silk embroidery on silk, it fits with itself very nicely. And wool does the same. Now, I've got a little short bit there. So I'm just tucking that end in under the spiky bit of his wing and coming back again. Now, especially when you're learning this technique, you will, from time to time, just pop straight out again. And everybody does that, even I do that, and I've been doing this technique for 25 years or more. But it just means that you're getting your threads... Oh, this is something fluffy come from the back there. You're getting your threads nice and close together. Now, the other thing about what I'm doing here oops there see I've just done it the other thing about what I'm doing here is that you can see my canvas is quite tight on the frame and a lot of people think you shouldn't use wool canvas because it can't take this sort of tension 
but this is just a single sheet of wool with no stabiliser and you can see how tightly it's laced on there, it's really really tight and it, it's absolutely fine once it comes off, there will be no problems with this whatsoever. It's a really good canvas for what we're doing. So all I'm doing with this first piece is I'm going backwards and forwards I'm basically just colouring in so you know it's not difficult I'm just colouring in I'm just treating the area as one big block of colour backwards and forwards over and over again now because I'm not going across the back and you shouldn't beat yourself up if you go across the back once. Everybody does that now and then. It's just human nature. But this is not satin stitch. We don't want big lumps of thread on the back of this technique. And there are different reasons for that. The first reason is that if you take the thread across the back all the time what you're going to end up with is a very, very lumpy, unsophisticated kind of finish. And your embroidery won't lay flat, it won't sit nicely. And the second reason is, I'm sure at Woolfest there are a lot of spinners, and I'm sure there are quite a few people at Woolfest who use a drop spindle. I've been using one myself since I was about 10 years old. And it's one thing to use a drop spindle. And remember, that was the only technology that was available for spinning wool in Western Europe until about 1300, when the Great Wheel came along. It's quite easy to be able to spin with a drop spindle once you've had a little bit of practice. But to be able to spin fine enough to then be able to ply that wool into a two-ply and have it even enough for embroidery. Because weaving and embroidery put very different demands on your thread. Then that would be a very, very skilled thing. And I've done it myself. And it actually takes far, far longer to spin a wool embroidery thread than it does to sew with it. So I reckon you'd be talking at least half a dozen very, very skilled spinners to one embroiderer hour per hour to be able to, you know, keep up with each other. So the thread itself, I've made a hole there, what have I done? The thread itself would have been quite a valuable resource because it would have been difficult to make. But also some of the dyes involved were quite expensive. So we're looking here at a madder. And I think this particular orange is from an English rather than a Turkish madder. Because when they're doing natural dyes, everybody bangs on about, well, it's your water quality, it's your water hardness that makes a difference to the end tone of your colour. And yes, it does, and hard water does make a difference with madder, but the original madder makes a huge difference as well. So, you know, I can get a stone ground, expensive Turkish madder, and that will give me much more crimsony reds than an English madder, which will give me sort of browny reds and very russety colours. And then I can get a French madder, which will give me much more sort of rosy reds and warm pinks. So there are lots of different things that influence your colour. And where you're sourcing your madder from would have made a difference to the price of the thread as well. And with madder, remember, it's got to spend several years in the ground in order to be a root that will produce enough colour to be a usable dye stuff. And especially in pre-conquest England and around the time of the Norman Conquest, you're talking about 
a civilization that had regular famines. There are women's wills from Anglo-Saxon England where they meant freeing the many hundreds of slaves that they bought in exchange for a loaf of bread during a famine. So growing something in that kind of economy that you can't eat is a huge risk for a farmer. So, you know, that puts colour into the realms of a true luxury product. And yes, there are hedgerow dyes, there are things like elderberries that will give you a lovely pink, but that pink won't last. Whereas the orange that you get from Adder dye, that will last, wash after wash and year after year, without fading. So, yes, there are lots of cheap things that you can gather for free that will give you a bit of colour, but it's a bit of colour that won't last very long. There's a reason why medieval textiles tend, especially early medieval textiles, tend to stick to this sort of core of weld, wood, madder, a little bit of kermes, the red insect dye, and perhaps some walnut. And that's because those colours, although they're more difficult to produce and perhaps they have to be farmed, those colours last. So producing colour in a medieval context was very, very expensive. Now you can see I've covered that whole area with these big, long threads. And this is quite a small design, so, you know, I could be covering an area as big as that between, you know, the whole canvas. And as you can see, that's really quite unstable the way it is, so we have to stabilise it. Before I go any further, though, I should show you what the back of that would look like. And I've got my waste canvas here, and you can see I've just done a little cube there. But if you look on the back of that cube, all there is on the back of that cube is there's a little row of dots on either side. And that's all you want to see at the back of your canvas by the time you've covered it. Now... As I said, that's really quite unstable. The minute I took that off the canvas, it would distort, it would, it would get caught on things and it would be very, very quickly destroyed. So I'm going to go down next to a single thread of the wool. And if you're using one of the kits, I would uh, cut the thread in two and use a shorter length. Because although the, the thread I use, I've got some old stuff which is just wool and it's from an unspecified breed it's all two plies and it's it's similar weight to Appleton's Cruel Wool this one that I've got here this lovely madder orange this is blue face Leicester so it's a bit more of a long wool and it's a bit tougher than the just ordinary woody wool um, so I've got to stabilise it and how I'm going to stabilise it is you can see that I've just come out at a right angle and I've put one long bar straight over the top of the laid work. This is a couching bar. Coucher, of course, in French means to sit still. So this couching bar is what we're going to use to make the wool sit still. But even that on its own, that's still completely unstable. That's going to get caught and knocked about just as much as the background threads would. So once I've put that background thread down, I work over it with a tiny little spiral, just of tacking stitches. They don't have to be particularly precise but they do need to be spaced a reasonable distance apart. I, I've had a lot of students who will try and either place them too far apart or too far together, and I think part of the practice of the thing is that you want them about four to five millimetres apart. Any closer together, then you're kind of wasting your efforts. You're doing more work than you need to. Any further apart and you leave the work open 
to losing all of its tension once you take it off the canvas and you also leave it open to snagging. Now the background bars, and I'm going to put another one across there, the background bars go a similar distance apart, so about four to five millimetres. I put another one down and then I work over the top of it. Now there isn't a great deal of precision in this. What I really don't want to do is I don't want to start lining those little tacking stitches up too precisely. I really want it to be more of a sort of brick arrangement where each of the tacking stitches on this bar goes halfway through the tacking stitches on the previous one. Because if you actually line them up, they can start to push the background laid work apart a little bit. So it looks at first like you do really, really quick progress because you cover that area incredibly quickly, but then you have to go back and stabilise it. And once you get a little bit of practice in, the stabilisation is pretty quick as well. So I'm just going to work all of that and I'll come back with here's one I did earlier. Once you've got all of your laden couch work filled in and with this little chap there isn't a lot of it, you can see that what you've got is just very flat areas of colour and the back of that should you should just see, if you see this piece here, the little rows of stab stitching down the side and then the back of the spiral stitch at the back and that's all you need to see at the back so it's very economical with thread because everything's on the front of the work and then all of the detail is put in doing split stitch now split stitch and its cousin stem stitch are two of the oldest embroidery stitches in the world and they're basically both back stitch and backstitch is one of those stitches that we all learnt to do as a child. So you can see I've put my stitch down and then it's called split stitch because I'm coming back up through the thread. So this is one stitch that you actually don't want to ever have to unpick because you're basically destroying that thread as you go along. So in this case we're using a single thread of split stitch and just doing the outlines. Now, in some medieval embroideries, particularly in the Bayer tapestry, this split stitch or a stem stitch phase is done first. I prefer to take the later medieval method of doing it second because you can cover up a lot of sins with it and you get a much, much neater edge by doing it second. Because basically, um, if you do cross stitch or tapestry, you might be acquainted with the idea that there are clean holes and dirty holes, which isn't nearly as smutty as it sounds. A clean hole is one through which no needle and thread have been pulled beforehand. So this one I'm just poking up here, that's the needle coming up through a clean hole. A dirty hole is one that's already been used. And basically what we're going to do is we're going to be using the dirty holes. We're going to be right on the edge. We want to be using the same holes as the very, very edge of the laden couch work. And that way you get a nice tight edge. And what I'm going to do is continue working my split stick over the laden couch work to create the folds in his wings because he's got kind of bat-like little wings. So I'm going to put that and there's no right or wrong to this, you just follow the lines that are already there. I think to about there is about right and then I'm going to come out here again and you can see I'm splitting the previous split stitch. I'm going to do that little bit in between, which is kind of like the webbing between a duck's feet. And then I'm going to come back up here. And I don't want to line them up too much because if you have them very regimented and all lined up, they start looking less natural. 
So try and stagger them a little bit. And then I'm going to work back down. Now the thing that you want to be aware of with split stitch is some people are very tempted to hurry it a little bit and stretch the stitches out. And the reason that I say split stitch is back stitch is that actually if you look at the back of your split stitch, the back of your split stitch should look like back stitch. Sorry, that's a bit of a tongue twister. It's quite hard to say and I haven't even had anything to drink yet. So, and you want to be going smaller when you go around these little curves as well. Now, I could go smaller and I could go carefully round and make those nice and round or I could use the split stitch and I could taper them out to little black gothic points just by putting a couple of extra stitches on the end there to make him well that's quite nice isn't it I think I'll put another one on the end of there it doesn't have points in the little salter in the little salter he has very rounded tips to his little wing thing I'm not sure it I, I think I call him baby chicken dragon because to me he looks like He's wearing a cape, like he thinks he's Batman or something. And he's about to jump off the coal house roof. But he looks like he's having a lot of fun, no matter what. So yes, I'll give him little tips. And you just do that by exaggerating the shape and continuing it along with a little bit of split stitch and the other thing that you can do with split stitch is you can as well as making those tips a bit longer you could also cover up if you've got a slightly jagged edge you can do just a couple of layers of split stitch over the top of it just to tidy up your lines now I've come to the end of that thread there I'll get another thread and I'll show you what I mean on this tail. Now if I was doing his tail, you can see that the edge of the laden couch work, even when you've been doing it for 20 or 30 years like I have, doesn't give you a completely smooth edge so one of the things we're doing with this split stitch is we're smoothing out that edge and if it's just a minor roughness like here where we've got that little bit sticking out then just one row of split stitch worked over the top of it will cover it up quite nicely but say I'd missed my pattern a little bit and I'd not filled it in very well what I would do or if there was a bit sticking out that I just wanted to cover up and still make the tail look smooth is what I would do is just park that little split stitch there and go back a little way split out from the stitch I've already done and just work another layer of split stitch over the top to cover any small marks or mistakes that I'd made on there. And that'll add a little bit of extra fatness to his tail and a little bit of extra shape, but it will also cover up any small mistake that I've done. And I think to echo those lovely pointy bits on his pointy pointy tail I think on his pointy pointy wings sorry I need to give him a pointy pointy tail so I think I'm going to work that right the way up there back 
down and really emphasize that point on his tail by using the split stitch. I could even give him a little heart on the end of his tail, couldn't I? Let's see what that looks like. I'm not necessarily going to connect it to the tail. Oh, he's going to have a black heart on the end of his tail. Because I'm doing quite a tight shape again, I want to do very small stitches, so not as long as I would usually do. I'm not sure if this is going to add anything to his aerodynamic qualities or not. I'm going to come out there to give a bit of a twist to that heart rather than making it a fine point. So I'm just doodling now. I get carried away and I get easily distracted. And nothing ever ends up like it's supposed to. Now this black colour that I'm using, which is actually a, a, almost a proper blackity black black black, I was actually trying to make a brown at the time, but uh, it varies depending on which indigo or wood vat I have going. If it's a particularly strong one, I tend to get black. Oh, I think that looks cute. This would be one of the more expensive medieval colours because this is made up of a compound. This is... I believe this particular batch was walnut shells and oak galls mixed together, then over dyed with a very strong madder, and then dunked in, I think I want to say an indigo bath rather than a walled one. So light green, which has to be dyed with natural dyes, you dye it yellow and then blue or vice versa it doesn't really matter that layering up of color makes the black a little bit more expensive than a solid color like ward which is just one dye or madder which is just one dye so i'm going to go right round the edge so I've outlined my little baby chicken dragon, <coughs> I've done his little eye and I've given him some white highlights and some white dots along his tail and as a finishing touch I'm just going to give him some little chicken feet and I'm going to do that using stem stitch. Now stem stitch is very similar to split stitch but instead of splitting the stitch I'm going to push the previous stitch to one side and make a kind of cabled effect. And it's quite nice to use this combination of split and stem stitches because stem stitch stands a little bit prouder from the canvas than split stitch. Split stitch sort of beds itself in a little bit whereas this stands up quite tall. And I'm just going to do this freehand because it's just a little chicken claw. Now I'm going to put, when I put this video on the Wolfest Facebook in the morning, I'm going to put a, a little drawing of how to do the pattern for those of you who would like it. I can't embed a PDF in Facebook. I've been trying to figure out how to do it. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give you a little photograph and you can print that off as a black and white and that will give you a pattern. So it's given him three little claws. I, I always think he looks like he's coming in for a crash landing. His little claws are out for purchase I think either side of him. There you go. So that's my little 
video of how to do laden couchwork medieval embroidery and if you'd like to go to my shop and buy one of my kits I have quite a variety of dragons I've got cats, dogs, people doing strange things I've got rude ones and in your kit you would get this wool canvas with the pattern drawn out you'll get a needle, a full set of instructions like the ones that I use at class and you'll get a personalised colour chart for your embroidery and you'll get the naturally dyed walls. So that's my little video of how to do medieval laden couch.